Welcome back, class. In, to, in this le lecture section, we're going to deal with John Calvin. And so we have a lot of detail about Calvin to cover. He lived from the 10th of July, 1509, to the 27th of May, 1564. So he's, he's considerably younger than Swingley or Luther. In terms of church life, through the influence of his father, Calvin became a chaplain to the altar of Lagassin in Noyon Chapel at the age of 12. This provided him ample revenue for study. In terms of his education, he was first tutored by the Bishop of Noyon, then studied at the Collège de la Marche before going to the Collège de Montague, which was the center of Catholic orthodoxy and was deeply involved in the battle against Luther's teaching. Though Calvin was exposed to the writings of Luther, Swingley, and Melanchthon during this time, there is nothing to indicate he was sympathetic to Reformed thinking before 1533. He earned his Master of Arts degree in 1529. At this point, his father decided not to allow him to pursue a career in the priesthood as had previously been intended, but chose that he should study law instead. Calvin was sent to Orleans to study law. Calvin made it time for other studies and learned Greek on his own in a matter of months, though this may also have been the cause of his constant sickness and his early death. He studied Greek under a Lutheran sympathizer named Melchior Volmar. Calvin went to Bourges in 1529 to study Roman law. He left suddenly upon hearing news that his father was dying. His father had been excommunicated from the church over an accounting issue relative to the bishop. And John and his, uh, and his also excommunicated brother Charles tried to have their father restored before his death. So John Calvin and his brother Charles, who had also been excommunicated, were trying to get their father restored to the church before he died. How this in, uh, event influenced his later decision to support the Reformation is not certain. After his father's death, he went back to Paris to pursue literary studies. He studied at the newly created uh, Collège de France and in 1531-32 wrote an unremarkable commentary on Seneca's De Clementia. Afterwards, he returned to Orleans and studied, uh, completed his law studies. His commentary on Seneca demonstrated that Calvin was truly in the line of humanist thinking. So what about his conversions and his work in the Reformation? Uh, a good place to look is Wendell's book, page 37. Uh, there's a quote there regarding Calvin's conversion. Wendell dates Calvin's conversion between August of 1533 and May of 1534 when Calvin resigned his ecclesiastical beneficence. Calvin came to be viewed as suspect on or about November 1st, 1533 and was forced to flee Paris under disguise. The report is that he dressed himself as a simple gardener, placed a garden hoe over his shoulder, and simply walked out of town and kept walking. While in hiding, he had access to a huge library, uh, which may have served as the basis for his preparations for writing the first edition of the Institutes of the Christian Religion. The Placards Affair, which occurred in October 1534, caused such a stir and violent reaction against the Reformation in France that Calvin uh, felt it necessary to, to leave France. He chose to go to Basel where he could study and write without fear of persecution. It was a city renowned for its intellectual climate and for its printing facilities. So he set out for Basel, passed through Geneva. So let's talk about Geneva. He arrived in Geneva in July of 1536 intending to stay only one night. Philip Schaff says Farrell at once called on Calvin and held him fast as by divine command. Calvin protested, pleading his youth, his inexperience, his need for further study, his natural timidity and bashfulness, which unfitted him for public action. But all in vain, Pharaoh threatened him with the curse of Almighty God if he preferred his studies to the work of the Lord and his own interest to the cause of Christ. Calvin then began preaching through Paul's epistles and other New Testament books in September of 1536. He was noted as a teacher of exceptional abilities. People flocked to hear him, but his attempts to bring practical reforms to the church and community in Geneva met with strong resistance from the city council. In 1537, Calvin and Pharaoh were accused of holding to Arian views of Christ. 
Calvin had an essentially functional Christology. He focused on the role of Christ rather than on the ontological nature of Christ. He also rejected the binding authority of the ancient creeds as being on equal par with scripture, and so refused to sign the Nicene Creed on principle of authority. In his Christology, Calvin focused on Christ as prophet, priest, and king. Calvin and Pharaoh were cleared of the accusations of Arianism. Most of the practical reforms that Calvin and Pharaoh desired were approved by the city council, but the council re refused to approve their proposed action regarding excommunication of disorderly church members. This became an obstacle that eventually led to Calvin having to leave the city for a period of time. He actually left uh, at the point of a sword with threat against his very life if he stayed. Uh, Calvin's reforms involved uh, close ties between the power of the civil government and the power of the church as to be a practical theocracy. So Calvin's Geneva was virtually a theocracy because of the close ties between church and local government. Uh, he fled from Geneva in April of 1538 and lived in exile in Germany until 1541. He is reported to have said he would rather die a thousand deaths than ever return to Geneva. What about his relationship with Philip Melanchthon? The two were introduced by mail through the efforts of Martin Bucer in 1538. Bucer, a former Dominican friar, was the leader of the Reformation in Strasbourg and a man of unique abilities in reconciling doctrinal differences. Calvin became pastor of a French-speaking congregation in Strasbourg. While here, Calvin married Idolette de Bure, a widow of a Dutch Anabaptist. Among other written works, Calvin produced the first French edition of the Institutes while at Strasbourg. Melanchthon introduced Calvin's writings to Luther, who read them with approval. Luther never expressed any hostility toward Calvin, though they never met personally. Calvin likewise held Luther in high regard. Melanchthon moved in the direction of Calvin in his view of the Lord's Supper, but more in the direction of free will in his understanding of the workings of grace. In spite of his theological differences, Calvin produced and published a French translation of Melanchthon's theological commonplaces in 1546. Well, what about Calvin and Geneva Part 2? Here's an interesting turn of, of events. A delegation from Geneva labored for months to get Calvin to return and resume his pastorate there. He said, I would rather suffer a hundred deaths then bear that cross on which one must perish a thousand times daily. Through a series of events, the city council had been reconstituted of men favorable to Calvin and his reforms. They eventually prevailed in persuading Calvin to return. He returned on the 13th of September, 1541, and upon entering the pulpit, picked up with the exact same text where he had left off three years prior. Calvin faced opposition after his return, which grew into a full-blown crisis in 1546. In 1548, a party Calvin referred to as the Libertines, these would be Anabaptists, gained control of the council, and this created an ongoing power struggle that lasted for five years. Much has been said also about Calvin's relationship to Michael Servetus, and we want to speak to that. Michael Servetus was a Spanish physician and a theological radical. He held to a Unitarian view of God and denied the true deity of Christ. He was, however, quite enamored of Calvin and carried on a lengthy correspondence with Calvin under a pseudonym, uh, writing letters back and forth. He was warned in writing repeatedly by Calvin not to come to Geneva. He was eventually captured, tried, and condemned to burning by the Roman Catholic Church. Before he could be brought to execution in 1553, he escaped and made his way to Geneva, where he lived unnoticed for several months, sitting every week under Calvin's preaching. A visitor to the city recognized him and pointed him out. The local officials arrested him and made plans for a new trial. Calvin was appointed the prosecuting attorney. The proceedings of the trial were dispatched to all the leaders of the Reformation throughout Europe and all of them to a man said that Servetus ought to die. You have to understand the climate in this day and age. Heresy was considered worse than murder. 
Because if you promoted heresy, you could kill the soul of a person. You could condemn a person to eternal torment and hell, not just in their physical life, but you could end their spiritual life. You could condemn them to hell. And so the promotion, the advocacy of heresy was considered a soul murder and therefore considered a capital crime. This is a, a historical context issue that has to be understood. The court, uh, at the end of the trial, insisted on burning Servetus at the stake. Calvin personally opposed it and begged the court rather to behead him as a more humane form of execution. Servetus was the only heretic burned by Protestants during this entire period, though the Catholic Church routinely burned heretics for centuries. Something else that needs to be made clear, Calvin did not attend the execution. He stayed home. He was not there when Servetus was burned at the stake. Calvin went to Servetus' cell repeatedly, along with Farrell, trying to persuade Servetus to renounce his heretical beliefs and embrace the gospel as presented in the Reformation writings. Farrell accompanied Servetus all the way to his execution, pleading with him to repent and believe on Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And so you need a little more context. As you hear people talk about Servetus and, and Calvin and the, the way it gets told is not always accurate, either in textbooks or by church history professors. You need a little more fullness to that. So there's a little bit more about Calvin and Servetus. Calvin lived out the rest of his life in Geneva. He was plagued by various illnesses throughout his life, including stomach complaints, kidney stones, and hemorrhoids, and he wrote about these at length in letters. Uh, curiously enough, in Calvin's day, the standard treatment for kidney stones was horseback riding to dislodge the kidney stones. But Calvin, due to his severe hemorrhoids, could not ride horseback. And so he suffered a great deal of physical distress throughout his short life. He died in 1564, at about the age of 50. And, and here's what you need to know. In terms of, uh, of writing, Calvin, in that short lifetime, produced three editions of the Institutes of the Christian Religion, each one expanded upon and, and translated into, written in Latin and in French. He also wrote a commentary on almost every book of the Bible. He didn't write a commentary on Revelation because he said, I don't understand it and I know when's enough. So he refused to write on Revelation and I, I think he didn't write a commentary on First and Second Chronicles, but he wrote a commentary on almost every other book of the entire Bible. He was a very prolific writer. So let's talk about his theology for a minute. The key to understanding Calvin is his view of God as majestic and absolute sovereign. This is the key to Calvin. He sees God as the majestic and absolute sovereign. God is revealed to humanity in creation and in the scriptures. Calvin notes that the fall of humanity uh, left men and women incapable of understanding God or coming to him in their own strength and mental abilities. Salvation requires a special efficacious work of grace which no one can merit. God, therefore, according to Calvin, has chosen from all eternity who would be the objects of his mercy and he uses the gospel as the instrumental means whereby the Spirit, as the effectual means, calls his elect to salvation through faith in Christ. Those whom God has chosen and called persevere by faith in Christ through the Spirit's enablement and so cannot fall away and be lost again. Their salvation is certain because it is accomplished by the sovereign power and purpose of God. Calvin understood the Lord's Supper as a special spiritual fellowship with Christ and one another when the elements are received in faith. And so for Calvin, Christ is spiritually present to uh, the believer, not so much in the elements as to the believer in the celebration of the event. Calvin's understanding of the meaning of baptism is quite accurate, but his understanding of the mode and proper recipients stands as contradictions to his understanding of the meaning. Calvin admits that the ancient mode was immersion, but he sees no necessary importance to retaining this ancient mode, uh, unlike Luther, who advocated for a return to immersion. Uh, he advocates infant baptism, not because it has the power to wash away original sin, but because in his mind it takes the place of circumcision, 
And just as everyone in Abraham's literal household was circumcised, so everyone in the Christian household should be baptized. Baptism does not ensure the salvation of the child, but it places the child in the visible covenant community with all the special privileges that relate to it. So for Calvin then, a true church is a church where the gospel is, is preached, the sacraments are celebrated, and church discipline is rightly maintained. So for Calvin, uh, a church that does not maintain proper discipline is not a true church. For Calvin, a church that does not preach the gospel is not a true church. For Calvin, a church that does not celebrate the Lord's Supper and baptism is not a true church. So these are key points that you need to remember and understand about the life and teaching of John Calvin. In the next lecture, we will deal with the Anabaptists and the Reformation in England.